All right, welcome back everybody. So I guess for today, what I had in mind is the following. One is hopefully we finish discussing, I think we have one or two papers left over from last time. So maybe we start with those uh, and finish our discussion of those. Um, two, I want to show you a few more examples of things that are, um, I think very useful. One, I'm gonna show you an example of a mixed effects regression model and sort of how to think about that some more. Uh, and two, uh, hopefully if we have time, we start talking about some time series analysis technique, uh, the interrupted time series analysis technique that I found to be also very useful. So um, hopefully we have some time to discuss that towards the end. Um, and I wanted to remind you that we are coming up to the end of the semester very soon. Uh, and if you haven't started thinking about and or writing your final reports, then it would be good to not postpone that much longer because actually so, you know, writing um, submittable quality piece of writing takes a lot of energy and time and a lot of iteration. So some of you were asking previously if I could suggest some intermediate milestones between uh, then and the actual final report. So for example, things like the literature review is one intermediate milestone. So that's something that um, ideally you could have already thought about and or drafted by now, or something that you can start thinking about very quickly. Uh, so that you have some time afterwards to focus on um, uh, introduction and methods and, and things like that, but get the lit review out of the way. The lit review is highly non-trivial. Uh, it sort of involves a lot of reading on your part. So, you know, uh, any research paper that you yourselves read, you probably have seen has dozens of citations. I think it's not uncommon for research papers to have upwards of 50 citations. This is of course not prescriptive, there's no recipe. I'm just saying the amount of uh, literature that authors tend to have to review these days is quite substantial just because there's a lot of published research out there on pretty much any topic. So, you know, doing a good job on a or half good job on a literature review will probably require a lot of reading on your part and a lot of thinking and synthesizing. Uh, and that just takes a lot of time uh, and it takes iteration. I, I, I myself can never get that done in one pass. So I always sort of typically take some notes to summarize what these different papers that I'm reading are about and sort of start synthesizing and putting them together and, and iterating over that many times before I am happy with uh, lit review. So, you know, if, if you're working on something, that's something you could already be working on uh, and something that I expect will take a lot of time. So please, please don't postpone that much longer. Um, we have four weeks left in the semester, I, I think. Um, and I really do care about the final reports. I, I care that you sort of, you know, put love and thought into writing those um, because I, you know, I think it, I think it matters. I think it makes a difference. I think they will hopefully all turn into submissions or publications that you are working on anyway. So it's hopefully the useful love and energy and time that you're putting into these, but it's a non-trivial amount of that. So, you know, please do not ignore the complexity of doing a good job at those. Okay. So let, let's, let's end here. Uh, this meta discussion. Um, we have two papers, I think. Do we remember what the papers are? I have one of them. It's, you have, uh, you have the... It's yours, the gender and tenure diversity. And, right. and I have right. one. What else do we have? Uh, I have another one. It's the Twitter, Twitter impact on paper citation. Okay, let's do the Twitter one first, and then we'll do the gender diversity one second, because it will tie into this mixed effects discussion that I want to continue with afterwards. Okay. Sound good? Yeah. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Hombo. Uh, today, I want to present this paper, uh, Twitter predict citation rates of ecological research. And for this presentation, I will focus on the regression model and analysis. Okay, so uh, a little bit of introduction, very brief one before we get to the, the paper. So um, at a high level, 
the content of this paper is very simple. It's basically saying uh, that uh, when someone tweet about a research project, does it help um, the helps the, this paper to get more citations? This is basically the entire uh, research question and the entire study. And if you look at it today, you might find this paper less interesting because it's uh, sort of common that people do this kind of thing. The researchers tweet about their paper a lot. And you might be surprised to see that this paper gets 100 plus citations because the, it, it sort of tears a, a common sense knowledge. But if you look back five years ago when this paper was published, uh, there was a stream of research studying so-called Web 2.0 and the application of Web 2.0 in distributing uh, and uh, spreading a lot of kind of information. So uh, the key feature of Web 2.0 is that it has a bunch of social media platforms that enable users to distribute, to generate and distribute content on their own. Uh, before then, before Web 2.0, probably most of the content uh, on the internet was generated by major organizations and news medias. Uh, but with Web 2.0 and uh, some featured platforms like Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, the users or common people uh, are able to distribute and generate the content. And at the time, there has been little knowledge about how we can use Web 2.0 platforms to distribute content. There has been people trying this, like uh, spread their, uh, distribute their papers, talk about the videos they like, all kinds of things, but um, people want to understand more. And because of that, there has been a lot of research emerges on how Web 2.0 platforms benefit the distribution and promotion of the content and how effective is uh, those platforms for normal people. So this is basically the background of this research. So uh, the research question is very simple. Generate two questions. First one is, does tweeting about research work leads to more citation? And if so, how strong is the effect? So uh, the also spend a large chunk of this paper uh, describing the way they collect the data and build the model, but I will ignore the collect data part. Basically, they have a collection of journal papers. Each point in our sample is a, a journal paper. And they include three sets of features into this model. The first one is individual paper feature. I was surprised to see that they only include one feature, which is the uh, time since publication, how many days have passed or how many years have passed since the paper was published. Uh, and the longer uh, you, the longer the, the age of the paper that you would expect, it will get more citations because it gives people more time to cite it. The second set is Twitter metrics. They include three sets of features. The first one is number of tweets, how many tweets mentioned that paper on Twitter. And the number of users, how many users on Twitter mentioned the paper is different from the number of tweets because one user can tweet a lot of times. And the third one is called Twitter reach. They basically take, in, take into account the inference or the number of followers of that, of that uh, author who mentioned the paper. If you have a lot of followers, you would expect that uh, uh, the Twitter have a higher reach um, and it probably leads to more citations. The last one is the journal effect because papers are from different journals and uh, papers from so-called good journals uh, probably have a higher impact or probably have a higher citation value. So they include journal impact factor as another variable. So three sets of variables, five independent variables in total. And outcome variable is the number of citation of that paper. So they actually have this uh, chain of process uh, procedures that they do to evaluate the model, evaluate the data and the model before they get to the final analysis and conclusions. I will talk uh, about this step in step, step by step. So the first one is they do evaluation of collinearity or multi-collinearity, and they also evaluate for non-linear relationship. To evaluate the collinearity, they run pairwise correlation between dependent variables. And if one, uh, two variables are highly correlated, they remove one of those variables from the independent variable. And for the second part, the way they evaluate nonlinear relationship is they draw bivariate plots. 
I actually don't know what it means. So I Googled it. Uh, Wiki, according to Wikipedia, that this plot should be uh, for each independent variables. You draw a plot with x axis to be the value of that independent variable and y axis to be the value of that uh, of the outcome variable. And you plot each sample in the graph and to see if they if you can tell there is a nonlinear relationship. And if so, you add a nonlinear term like a square of that variables. And by their conclusion for this analysis is that there was one variable, the number of users are highly correlated with the number of trees. So they removed this one. And they didn't find nonlinear relationship. So they just don't do any modification based on that. So the second one is uh, they do standardization and they cope with the inter sample correlation. Uh, basically, it's the same thing as we studied in class uh, that they scale all variables to a variable of mean one and standard deviation, or uh, mean zero and standard deviation one. And they consider papers that are published uh, in the same journal might have some intrinsic correlation. So they add a random effect on the journal variable. And lastly, they compare the effect scale of the variables. They actually did two things. The first one is compare the significant level and estimate uh, coefficient of scale, which is the same thing as we learned in class, uh, where the coefficient was significantly different from zero and uh, how strong is the effect. And they do the second thing called they compared a kike weights of independent variables. Actually, I don't know what it is. Uh, but basically, the interpretation of this weight is that the more, uh, the higher this weight, uh, the independent variable will be more in, important. Uh, a similar things I learned is so-called ANOVA, which basically explains the variance, uh, how much variance these independent variables can explain outcome variable. And the more variance we can explain, uh, the more important this independent variable is. So these are basically the, the kind of uh, comparison they do. So um, the final result, uh, the first one is the effect size and the, the archaic weight um, graph. So the X axis in this graph is the effective size. They add standardized because uh, all the variables are standardized. Uh, and the Y axis is the relative importance, which is basically the archaic uh, weights uh, that are calculated here. And here you have four different shapes. Each shape corresponds to one variables. And you can see the uh, red triangle and the square. Um, the five corresponds to five year, uh, five year journal impact uh, factor and the treat ridge. And you can tell that those variables are not significantly correlated with outcome variable because the Oh, this bar is 95 confidence interval because, uh, and they are not significantly correlated because the 95 confidence interval uh, contains the value zero. And the, the variable trader ridge is uh, significantly correlated with outcome variable, uh, same as um, the trader uh, time since publication. And according to the, uh, this important weight that they are considered very important and you can also tell that time since publication has a much stronger effect than the Twitter reach based on the effect size. So here uh, is the final result of, of this paper. We have five independent variables, one of them removed because of collinear relationship and two variables we didn't find a significant correlation uh, between the independent and outcome. And for these two variables, uh, this one is significantly correlated, but the effect size is not as strong as time since publication. These are the uh, final result of this paper. Okay, now I have covered basically everything about this paper. I do have some concerns about the threat to validity of this paper, um, and I listed it here. So firstly, I don't think they include enough independent variables uh, in the model. Uh, for example, if we want to talk about um, the individual paper variables, you can add things like how many authors do you have? Uh, or how influential are those authors? Those are kind of also predictors uh, for the number of citations a paper will get. And secondly, I do think they have some problems uh, with the evaluation of the model validity or data validity. 
So for example, when they do multi-collinearity test, so they do pairwise test uh, instead of the um, va VIF value or variance inflation factor. Okay, uh, those uh, accounts for the multi-collinearization, uh, the, co the, the correlation among a set of variables in the, instead of just the pairwise variables, which is much better. And the third one, there is a, a lack of causal evidence. Actually, I was working on a paper that is very similar to this one. And uh, the first submission of my paper gets the same feedback that the reviewers think I have a lack of causal evidence, which I think is fair. And I think this paper have the same similar problem as well. Uh, so I will just use a very simple example. Um, this paper basically saying that they find a correlation between the mentioned uh, a paper being mentioned on Twitter and the increase and its increase in citation. And they, they consider it's possible that um, being ma mentioned on Twitter leads to an increase in citation. But let's say another explanation would be some external event. Let's say this paper winning best paper award, which will lead to uh, both of these outcomes. It will lead to, uh, leads to more discussion about this paper on Twitter because it wins the best paper. And also we near best paper will lead to increasing citation. So here we can see there's no causal effect uh, between the mention on Twitter and the increase in citation. But being mentioned on Twitter is just an indication that there might be some external event like winning a best paper happens to that paper, which leads to an increase in citation. So there is a lack of causal evidence um, in this paper. And I think that's everything I want to present. Cool, thanks, Bobo. Any, any thoughts or comments? Yeah, specifically on this last thing with the winning best paper award and uh, mentions on Twitter, not necessarily uh, being correlated with an increase in citations. I think they sort of accounted with this because they had time since publication in the in the model, and you win the best paper award when it's published, right? So uh, that's at a fixed point in time, and essentially everything after that would account for this, right? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I do think this is not a perfect example. I just uh, uh, think of one example I just added in. Um, right. What I'm saying is that there are other events that might cause both of these things. And right, like publication of a news article. Related yeah, yeah. To, yeah, yeah. On this, I think, I think the comment that it's core is valid. I, I agree with that. I think um, they haven't necessarily excluded all plausible alternative explanations. I agree with the comment at that fundamental level. I disagree with the specific example. I, for one, journals don't give out best paper awards. So this would sort of be technically impossible to be a confounding factor here. Mm -hmm. Only conferences hand out the words as far as I know in computer science at least. So th also awards are being given to five to 10% of papers at a conference. So even if that were the case, it would be a minority of the data points in the sample. So I think the example you gave is implausible personally. But I think at the at its core, I think the comment is, is valid. Yeah, I agree. I do think it's not a good example. Maybe I should change that. Can you say a bit more about the data set? Uh, how many data points did they have? How many papers did they model? And when did they measure citations? Is there some sort of temporal precedence there that would be required to make these causal claims? Uh, yeah, I need to check how many, let's see how many data points. I didn't forget the exact, I didn't remember the exact number. So uh, for the, the date, I don't think this uh, look at a specific date, but well, but more of that, they just uh, uh, pick the date where they do study when they to, go to Amazon. To, to rephrase, did they count citations after the tweets happened or before the tweets happened? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. 
Mm. It's, you know, I think the causal relationship would only make sense in, in one direction, right? If citations happen after tweets. Yeah, but um, I don't think they're looking at the intervention of tweets. So uh, I think what they did is that they select, uh, they select at the time of their study, how many tweets has been posted to that paper. It's not like this, look at a specific tweet and see how many new citations does this paper get right after that tweet, but more like a long time period, I see. Could it be that every citing author tweeted about having cited after they cited? Could be. Mm -hmm. So I guess they have a couple of thousand paper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any more thoughts? Something you liked or hated? Did you like anything about this paper? Uh, not about this, but my power just came back on. I'm just waiting for my network to reboot. I'll be right back. Yep, well, no worries. We'll come back to your paper. It should only be a, about 30 seconds. I guess we should wait for 30 seconds then. Huh. Do you, can you say a bit more, Bobo, about this random effect? We didn't get to talk much about that, and it's very important. Um, yes. Um, let's see. So why do we need it in the first place, and what does it do? Oh, yeah. So um, the reason we need it is because that papers are from different journals in the sample. And they think that papers from the same journal might have some intrinsic correlation. And then they think they should include a, a random effect. And I think, I didn't remember exactly, they add a random effect in this variable. They allow um, the journal impact factor to have different effect if the journal are different. Actually, personally, I do. I think they should also do it for other uh, independent variables. Like they should allow the number of tweets to have different effect if the papers are from different journals. Yes, but I think based on my memory, because I read this paper last week, I think they only do it for this. They only add the random effect for this variable. Okay, I'm muted. Yeah, I, I realize. Thank you. The key issue, if I can rephrase that, is that we have multiple observations, multiple papers collected, sampled from the same journals. Mm -hmm. So those papers from the same journal are not independent observations. Yes. They're necessarily belonging to the same journal by construction, by the, the way they were sampled. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's possible that they're not independent. It's possible that the journal is very popular and gets lots of citations or lots of tweets or something. So yeah. It has nothing to do with the quality of the papers or something about the papers themselves, but more because the side effect of the journal being somehow popular. Yes. And I do think they should do it for other variables because it's possible that the papers from the same journal, they probably have the same set of audience. That's why the number of tweets that they got probably be also correlated in some way. Mm -hmm. Right, so this idea of clustering of observations by some higher level entity, 
is something that comes up all the time when modeling, um, I don't know, pe people data of sorts, or anything in social sciences. Uh, like anything is anything and everything is clustered by something. Uh, there was a very good comment. I don't know, Ben or Kyle, somebody last time was asking, or you, Bobo, I don't remember. I'm sorry. Somebody was asking last time, uh, isn't everything clustered always anyway? Uh, yes, right? So we, we could say that we're all clustered by a planet ultimately, right? So we're also non independent in that sense. There's some higher level. Uh, variable that you could group us all by. Um, so you, that's why we're sort of talking about this a little bit uh, in some depth about this idea of clustering and how to deal with that when modeling, because it comes up all the time. You'll find that um, to be a very, very common occurrence. Okay, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the second half of, of today. I guess this maybe is a good transition to the second paper. Jeremy, you ready? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Let's see if I have everything set up right. And this button. And this button. All right. Um, Okay, this paper was called uh, gender, gender and Tenure Diversity in GitHub Teams. Um, it's written by a few people. You might know some of them. Um, let's see. The high level questions that were being asked in this paper were, how diverse are online teams with respect to gender and tenure? Um, does gender diversity depend on tenure slash team size? And how do gender and tenure diversity relate to, to outcomes such as productivity? Um, these were the, the high level questions that they were asking and trying to study with the um, motivation of if, if, you find, uh, if you find some correlation say between gender and tenure diversity and productivity, you might be able to advise teams on how to better construct themselves so that they can in increase their productivity. So these are four hypotheses that were explicitly listed and tested in this paper. Um, they were formed by an extensive literature review that took up maybe the first three or four pages of the paper. I'm like really underselling how much work went into asking these four questions or forming these four hypotheses, uh, but it's not terribly important to the, uh, the quantitative uh, study. So I, I sort of gloss over it here. Um, but the hypotheses that they came up with based on literature reviews were that gender diversity should have a positive effect on productivity. Gender diversity should have a negative effect on turnover where turnover is people leaving teams. Um, and that uh, tenure diversity should have a positive effect on productivity. Tenure diversity meaning uh, you have a mix of people who have worked on a project for a long time and people who are pretty fresh on a project. So that should have a positive effect on productivity and also a positive effect on turnover. More diversity uh, means more turnover. That, these are the, the hypotheses. The study design here was a mixed method study, um, a, both a qualitative and a quantitative. I'm going to skip over the first part here where uh, a survey was done of GitHub contributors. And, uh, and the, I'm going to skip right to the, the quantitative study of uh, the data set of GitHub developers and projects. And uh, what's modeled here is uh, turnover and productivity. And there's a bunch of um, independent variables that they study here. Um, I'll just skip right to the results of the qualitative study. They found that um, after their interviews, I forget how many uh, interviews there were, but it was like not an insignificant amount. Um, participants recognize that team members are anybody who contributes to a project. Uh, team members were aware of aspects of other members such as gender and technical ability. So being aware of gender uh, would be important here. And uh, diversity does matter to con contributors, but the perceived effects vary. So people 
signaled that they cared about uh, the diversity of contributors, but uh, they gave um, effects, they described effects that weren't necessarily the same effects uh, that gender and um, tenure diversity actually had. So for the quantitative study, they needed a huge diversity data set. These were mined from GitHub. I think this used the GH torrent data set, which is continually mining uh, GitHub commits as they come in and logging them to a big old database. This uh, data set construction was actually really uh, involved. Um, so just the first part, part here about uh, cleaning the data set. Uh, one problem with uh, GitHub is that users have different accounts and they all belong to the same user. So uh, the paper glosses over this uh, just like I am here because it's, I think, a really in-depth, difficult thing to do this. Um, they used a series of heuristics inspired by previous works that are used to unify um, different accounts that happened to belong to the same person so that they wouldn't be, uh, they, they wouldn't be, um, they wouldn't be counted multiple times, essentially. Um, they also excluded inactive projects, which were projects with less than 100 commits or less than 90 days since the last activity. And uh, they also excluded projects without teams and teams were defined as having at least four contributors. And uh, finally, they inferred gender, excluding projects for which they could not infer gender for at least 75% of contributors. Uh, I'm going to get into this one on the next slide. But in the upper right, I have the, the statistics about the data set. Um, the important things here are uh, the number of contributors that after they filtered out were 671,000. Of these, they were able to identify the gender of uh, almost 10,000 women and about uh, 150,000 men. So gender inference, uh, the paper got into a little bit more, and I think this is a th this is a really tough one. Um, so gender was inferred based on contributors' names, and uh, this is really difficult. Uh, a big point that was brought up in the paper is that if you're doing this inference of gender for names, the country data is really important. So Andrea is a really popular Italian man's name, but in most other countries, it's a woman's name. So the country data is really important to pull in and identify accurately. Of the 671,000 users, they were able to identify countries for 12 or 12 and a half percent of users. And they only considered uh, reliable name Disclosure, disclosures, which were defined as names having two parts that are separated by a space. 40% um, of users fit into this category. Um, after all of this, they were able to infer gender for 32.6% uh, of contributors. 91% were male, 9% were female. Um, just to give you an idea of the reported accuracy numbers, uh, these again, this gender identification thing was based on prior work. Um, the accuracy, the, the precision was ninety three percent. So I'm not um, I'm not too concerned about the accuracy of uh, this gender inference. Uh, and then they modeled based on a bunch of different variables. So the dependent variables, again, were productivity and turnover. Productivity was defined as the number of commits in a given quarter, uh, where quarter refers to uh, three months of the year. Um, turnover was the fraction of a team in a given quarter that is different from the team with respect to the previous quarter. So this is the amount that this is the fraction of the team that has changed since the previous quarter. Uh, and then independent variables were gender diversity, which is this Blau index. Um, it's one minus uh, the sum of the proportions of these eyes are male and female. 
is P is the proportion. So you, you sum the uh, squares of the proportions and uh, you subtract that from one. Um, there was also tenure diversity as an independent variable. Um, commit tenure is number of days between first commit and the end of a given quarter. Project tenure was defined as the number of days between the earliest event in the project and the end of a given quarter. And then there were control variables, which were also part of the model, um, but were not considered as uh, independent or dependent. So team size was one of the control variables. This is just number of contributors. Forks is number of forks per project. Quarter index is the index number of the quarter from the start of the project. So whether it's the first, second, third, or so on quarter. Uh, overall activity is the total number of commits in the project. Age is the difference between the maximum quarter index and the index containing the first commit. Projects can be older than their first commit, so this isn't necessarily just the index of the current quarter. Um, tenure median is the median tenure of uh, members of the project, and comments is just the number of comments left by a contributor. So the the models that there were two models generated. Well, there were approximately two models generated. One was uh, with respect to gender diversity. One was res with respect to tenure diversity. Um, there, uh, one of them was a mixed effects model, which controlled for the project and the time window when the measurement was taken. Um, we had talked about mixed effects models a little bit at the end of, I can't remember which lecture, but it was uh, pretty recently. Um, and I'd said uh, approximately, two models, because one of them was a segmented model where the variable ranges are split according to some structure. So uh, I believe it was team size and uh, piecewise regression models were fit. So it was a small, medium, large team uh, split and a model was fit for each one. And another thing was because they're considering gender diversity, uh, one of the requirements was that at least one woman was on each team. If a team did not include at least one woman, it was excluded from the data set. So here is the productivity model uh, that I talked about. These are the three, uh, again, segmented by small, medium, large team. Small teams were less than 11. Medium teams were between 11 and 29. And uh, anything greater than uh, 30 was considered a large team. The control variables here explain, uh, play a dominant role in explaining the variance. So these are things that aren't uh, gender diversity or, ten or tenure diversity. Um, I, the, I'm trying to remember exactly. Well, the important thing here is that uh, gender diversity, that's uh, this value here, um, the effect size of this is relatively small com compared to something like, say, total commits. Uh, but it is statistically significant. So they claim that this confirms hypothesis one, which is that, uh, I'm trying to remember the exact wording that I used here. It's, it's that gender diversity has a positive effect on productivity. Um, they also found that commit tenure was also positive and significant as they, um, as they had hypothesized. And then this is the turnover model. Uh, this is a single regression. This was not segmented. Again, controls explained a majority of the variance. Um, but they found that uh, gender diversity was not significant here. So the second hypothesis where gender diversity has a negative effect on turnover was not confirmed. And uh, tenure diversity was found to be positive and significant here. Uh, so this confirmed the fourth hypothesis about uh, tenure diversity having a positive effect on turnover. This is my last slide. I don't, I didn't get much more out of this quantitative study. So th these were the conclusions that I saw and the conclusions that were drawn.
just a clarification question. What's the outcome variable for the first model? The, the, the two variables here were, so turnover was um, the difference in, turnover was the difference between uh, the team in the previous quarter and the team in the current quarter. So the proportion of the team that is different mm -hmm. quarter to quarter. Um, productivity was, I believe, number of commits. I have to, yes, it's the uh, log of the number of commits here. It's in this quarter? Because Excuse I see the total commits was in the control variable. I think one is total commits for the project up until that quarter. Yeah, total commits is slightly different. Where is it? Uh, sorry, I wrote it down. Yeah, Bogdan, Bogdan's right here. Uh, so log number of commits is log number of commits within a specific quarter. Total commits is the total number of commits to the entire project from the start of the project until now. OK. Um, I was also told by a friend to shame whoever made these tables because they're unreadable. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. We should, uh, we'll talk more about formatting and layout and presentation. That decimals need to be aligned. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll come back to this. We'll come back to this in a future it's, lecture. It's I, uh, I've learned a lot in the meantime. I, 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 I agree. So one thing I want to bring up here that sort of concerned me was that there are components of these models that are not statistically significant. And it wasn't clear to me why they wouldn't be removed. From a model. Because I, there's a theoretical reason to include them as controls. We expect them to correlate with the uh, outcome. So what is the conclusion when that doesn't happen? Is it that your theory was maybe wrong or that you don't have a thing to conclude there? Um, I'm not saying that this was the wrong thing to do. I was just trying to figure out what the right thing to do is. It's probably a number of things. It could be that their, the variance they explain is explained by something else that's already in the model. So yeah. there's nothing left for them. It could be that they weren't precise enough measurements of the construct they were trying to operationalize. And that's why they don't show up in the way you'd expect them. It could be that this they don't align really well with the constructs, right? So maybe they're measuring something a little bit different than they are should measure. It could be that the theory was wrong. Yeah. It could be any number of things. It's sort of hard to say. It could be that you don't have enough data. I was wondering when this paper studied the uh, diversity, do they look at the all contributors or do they only like the only look at the core contributors? There I don't believe there was a distinction between the two. Um, the, it can because of the conclusion from the, um, from the qualitative study that uh, team members consider anyone to be a contributor that does anything on the project, not just commits, um, they, they considered everyone to be a contributor. So uh, anyone that comments, anyone that opens a pull request, writes documentation, things like this, um, it doesn't necessarily have to do with um, commits. Yeah, I, I just think that uh, some casual committers, casual, casual, ca casual committers that they probably just, if they just commit once, they probably won't have too much effect to lower productivity. Mm -hmm. And that might account for why the, the effect of the scale of that effect is so small. Yeah. So the, uh, I, just, I just looked at the paper, the R squared for the uh, gender and tenure diversity 
for these models falls between one and two and a half percent. So the, the gender and tenure diversity, where it explains something, explains between one and two and a half percent of the variance, uh, which is relatively low. I don't, I didn't see what, it, what the overall model was, um, but I probably just missed it. I guess some things in this paper have aged better than others. The, the graphics maybe could use some refresh. But also, you know, one thing that now with my newly found wisdom since, I don't know, six years ago um, or so when I did this, I guess I would maybe me be a little bit more cautious in interpreting these results? So my, my, my sort of disappointment with this paper, not that it's a disappointing paper, it's that there's, this required a lot of work just to generate this model, like a whole lot of work. Um, and it sort of fizzled out at the end because, you know, these were the results. Um, and I think it unfairly represents the amount of work that had to go into just generating this data. Um, identifying genders of users on GitHub is um, difficult at best. Um, also, I mean, uh, Timnit, uh, who just, uh, who's now famous for being the AI ethicist fired from Google, uh, gave a talk on Friday here um, with HCII. And uh, one of the things that she brought up is like the entire concept of studying binary gender already imposes this norm on the users when we don't actually, it's, it's not actually possible to, to know unless someone reports and it's not necessarily a binary value. Um, that doesn't make this any, I, that doesn't mean that this isn't a good thing to study. It's just that it's, you know, slightly more difficult than looking at binary gender. I mean, I, I, I don't want to speak for her. I think she's more categorical in that this is a bad thing to study just because it's so impossible to study it and, and capture it. Yeah. Uh, I think I agree with that to a large extent, but I also, recognize that all models are flawed in some way right i mean it i i think it's valuable to study some sort of so someone's external representation and how they choose to represent themselves does have an impact on their interaction with the rest of the team that was that was one of the conclusions of the uh the qualitative study here so it, it's nice it would be nice to study but it's you know, obviously more nuanced than, than binary here. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I hope I can't, I don't remember the writing exactly. I, I hope we were clear about that even at the time. I would I certainly be clear it, about I, that I now. Think, I think it was, um, but I, I thought that was sort of important to bring up with this. Any more thoughts on this, comments, things you liked or hated? I have a question slash comments. Um, Jeremy said that the teams without women or teams with no diversity were dropped from the data set, right? Mm -hmm. wouldn't, wouldn't it be important to include teams with no diversity as basically the far end of that scale? And that could change the results of this possibly significantly, right? So why were they dropped? Yeah, um, they were, so you're right, they, they were dropped probably because of how um, imbalanced the data is in that there were very, very, very few teams with any diversity and the overwhelming majority, most teams, almost all teams had no diversity at all, according to this measure. Um, so from a modeling perspective, it's sort of impossible to model these very imbalanced 
sets with the kinds of models that we were using. It's like one thing we could have done probably is maybe so randomly sample a small number of the non fully non-diverse ones and to add those in. Um, another thing we could do, I guess, as follow-up is to compare these productivity levels overall between teams with any kind of diversity uh, and teams with no diversity at all um, to kind of get at what you're asking. So there are things that we could have done more or we could do as follow-up to try to answer this. The, um, the reason was pragmatic. It just was impossible to model with the kind of imbalance that there is in the data. We, we had to do this for just feasibility reasons. Um, and I, I suspect if you do model it that way, what will happen is all of the points you're interested in, which is these points with diversity, would just be outliers in the model. You would end up only modeling non-diverse teams. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was just a necessity of how the data was distributed. No, no other theoretical reason. By the way, so uh, the other meta point here, you can see how like, even this arguably quite extensive study with lots of data collection and analysis and so on, like no single study can ever cover all aspects of a, of a research question. Like even this arguably quite extensive study misses so many dimensions that are relevant here to answering these questions that, that you all brought up. But it just shows how um, you can't ever do this in a single paper, basically. You sort of have to kind of build this over time through multiple studies and so on, through replications, through independent research teams, blah, 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 all of the things that we uh, talked about earlier in the semester. It's never just the one paper. Okay, so let's then move on to um, a slightly uh, different topic, uh, kind of building on this mixed effects uh, examples that we saw, both papers that we saw um, use this framework of mixed effects modeling um, and had these random effects uh, in there to account for some kind of hierarchy or nesting that was present in the data. In Bobo's paper about Twitter, there was this random effect to account for the fact that the papers they had sampled were published in the same journals. Uh, and there was probably some correlation, some clustering, some correlation between the papers from the same journal. Uh, they, you can't really consider them to be independent observations. And the paper that Jeremy just presented um, we have multiple observations of these teams collected at different points in time. Um, the data was organized in three month windows, quarter windows, uh, and uh, every project or team that was observed was potentially observed over many quarters. So contributed many individual data points to, to this overall sample. Uh, and obviously these things are also not independent, right? So if you have a highly effective productive team this quarter, chances are they'll also be highly effective and productive the next quarter, right? Um, for all kinds of other reasons. So um, it's important to account for this clustering and hierarchy that is present in the data. Uh, and this is where this um, mixed effects framework comes in. But I wanna show you something, let's see. I want to show you something to hopefully entertain you a little. So remember how, let's see, let's do this one. Remember how a lot of the examples we've had in class were about all kinds of gotchas that you could fall uh, into when doing quantitative analyses. We've had many examples of all kinds of gotchas and statistical traps and trickery that you could fall victims to. I want to show you one more. This is um, probably a very famous uh, uh, one. It's sort of something referred to as Simpson's paradox. You will you will have seen this, or you will find examples of this uh, online. So let's, here's an example. Uh, is my screen visible? Can you see this? Yeah. All right. So here's an example. I have a data set. It's artificial, 
um, because I want to illustrate a point. But here's a data set of um, instances from five people typing, five typists, um, of um, measurements of two variables, the speed with which they were typing some piece of text on the x-axis versus the number of errors uh, they made while typing those pieces of text on the y-axis. Okay, so looking at this overall relationship between typing speed on the one hand and typing errors on the on the other hand, what do you see? Faster you type, the less error you will make. The faster you type, the less errors you make. Right. So you see this negative relationship here. Yeah, do you all agree? Okay, so if I were to model this with something that we've seen so far, so here's a simple linear model. Uh, I'm modeling, let's see, can we make this any bigger? I'm modeling um, errors as a function of speed. Okay, and these are the same variables that you saw plotted in the chart in the plot above. So there's nothing, nothing fancy here. Uh, and you see that being confirmed in the regression summary. Okay, so you see that there's a statistically significant association between typing speed and number of errors. And you see that the relationship is negative as indicated by this negative coefficient, right? So for every unit increase in typing speed, whatever that's measured in, I get 0 0.9, so note the 10 to the minus one here, I should make these prettier, 0 0.9 fewer errors on average. Okay? So negative correlation between speed and errors. So here's the catch, okay? Um, oh, yeah, and you have some diagnostics. They look pretty decent uh, for the most part. There's some issues here with, um, with this last one, but by and large, uh, not too bad. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about that now. Here is um, here's the catch, though. I told you that this data was collected from five individual typists. Uh, and what I've done is I've color-coded the individual observations coming from each of the five typists. Uh, and I've further drawn uh, a regression line for each one of the five typists, only including their data. And I'm showing you with these little uh, black dots here, the mean for those uh, five typists. So what, what do you see here when I, um, when I break this down by typist? The faster they type, the more errors they make. Which is arguably what you'd expect, right? Mm -hmm. Right, because you know you just it's um, it's less precise the faster you type, so you'd expect to see that. And indeed, if you were to look at them individually for each and every one of the five here in the sample, you would see that you would see that the faster they type each one of them individually, the more errors they tend to make. But if you actually look at this data set as a whole, right? So I'm coming back to, um, I promise this is the same data set. I'm not lying about any of this. Uh, this is the same data set without taking into consideration the typist. Okay, you can see this very uh, clear negative relationship overall. This is also interesting because this, this downward trend is expected because faster typists are more accurate because they have more practice with typing. Mm -hmm. Yep. But so note how, so this is referred to as Simpson's paradox in the literature. And you'll find many examples of this. The key idea is that depending on the level at which you're observing, a particular relationship, it may look very different. Okay, so if I look at this as um, an overall uh, overall relationship over the entire sample, I would conclude from this that the relationship is the correlation is negative. If I look at this individually, 
it's very clear that the correlation is in the opposite direction. Okay. Uh, and so the, the point is that you would be easily misled, right? So depending on which of the, the Ds you're looking at and possibly um, generating the wrong conclusions and so the opposite conclusions from, from what you might want or expect or is, is really true there in the data. Right, so now the question, the modeling question is how do we capture this, right? So how can we model this data set in a way that allows us to capture ideally both of these relationships. I think Jeremy was right, right? So um, there are two sources of variation that could be used to explain the rate of errors that overall faster typists make fewer mistakes. That's the group level pattern. Uh, but also when typing faster, each individual typist tends to make more mistakes. That's the individual level pattern. Um, right, so the question is, you know, how might we model this data set to capture these patterns that are clearly there, right? Because the simple linear model that I showed you that we started from uh, that does not account for the typist, uh, that is clearly insufficient. Uh, you agree with that? Okay, so what, what can we do here? Any thoughts? But let's do something we've learned and seen many instances of first. So I guess you should average them if you're going to use them as a group. Otherwise, you should split them into different uh, plots. Yeah, so we talked about that last time, kind of how to deal with uh, how to remove this non-independence. One way would be to... Um, replace each one of these sets of observations belonging to an individual typist with their mean, uh, the point, the dots, the black dots, you see they're represented in, the, in this chart. That would be one idea, but I don't want to um, reduce the size of my sample here. Uh, I don't want to throw away data. I'm, I want to keep the data as is. I'm just asking for ways to model this to account for these two different sources of variation. Um, without actually reducing the size of my sample. And, and obviously without also, um, I mean, I could build individual regressions for each of the five typists. I've actually done that because you see the lines drawn here in the plot, um, but um, those do not capture this overall trend, right? Uh, the, the group level pattern. Uh, those would only capture the individual level patterns. Right, so how can I jointly model all of these things all together in one model? Some thoughts. Transform the data so the means of each typist are coincident. Uh, yes, that's a yeah. So we're, we'll come back to this. Um, yeah, that's a good. It's a good direction. Let's come back to that. Give me a minute to to build that up. Um, something arguably simpler is to literally control for the typist. Right, so I, I have information about um, who the typist was for each of these five typists in my sample. I could add a variable to indicate who the typist was. I could add that to my model. Right, so effectively controlling for the individual typist. Does that make sense? That's arguably something that you could start with. So I've done that here. I have um, modeled the typist as a fixed effect. So this is the same model as before, errors as a function of speed, but I've added an extra predictor variable, which is the identifier of the typist. Um, I've made this, the, you don't have to worry about the as dot factor thing in front of it here. Um, I've only done that because I think the identifiers were integers and I'm not sure if R knows how to handle that correctly. So I, I told R to treat these as categorical variables, not as numbers, right? It's not that I can increase the unit in typist by one. That sort of doesn't make any sense. They're all just random, well, not random, but they're just categorical identifiers. They're um, 
there's no notion of um, of scale. So um, okay. that's what you see uh, you see here. Okay. So now, if I look at the summary of this model, which is here, you see now several things. So first off, you see this positive correlation between speed and errors. Okay, so the higher the speed, the more errors. Yeah, and that corresponds exactly to the relationship you expect to see individually, like within within um, each of these typists, right? The faster they type, the more errors they tend to make on average. Um, and the other thing you see is some estimates of how um, the mean number of errors varies across typists. Uh, remember, we may have talked about this last time, um, R has this silly default way of ordering um, levels uh, when you have a categorical variable, it does it alphabetically. So it just happens here that one is the lowest value of this variable alphabetically. Uh, and that's why you see these, uh, you only see estimates for the other four, right? Because they're sort of done relative to one as a baseline. Okay, which is not part of the model. Okay, the trick question, why is one not part of the model? Why, why can't I have one, two, three, four, and five all together? You need a baseline value. You can't have no typist, doesn't make sense. Okay, but wh why? Because they will be um, perfectly collinear with each other. Because mm -hmm. because they're perfectly identifiable. Okay, since this is a linear combination. Okay, if this thing has uh, has five possible values, knowing four of the five perfectly identifies the fifth one. Okay, so it's computationally impossible to estimate that. Right? If, I know the va if I know that it's not two and not three and not four and not five, it must be one. There can, there can be no uncertainty, right? So always you will see, you know, for every, if, if a categorical variable has n, n possible values, you will see n minus one estimates in your regression. Okay, because it's sort of you would need otherwise you need one one fewer than than the number of values you have to perfectly identify all of them. That makes sense. If you have a boolean, you will only see one one value. You won't see both, right? So that that's the real reason why you need one as a baseline. Jeremy was saying you need one as a baseline, but you need one as a baseline because so four perfectly identify all five. If you know the values of the four of the five, you can identify the fifth one. Okay, all right. Um, so this is one way of doing it. And so this is fine. You're capturing this individual level pattern, higher speed leads to more errors, but you're not, you, we've missed out on the group level pattern, right? We're not seeing that anymore. Okay, so let's see what else we could do. Um, Right, so another way, okay, quick aside here. So another way of achieving the same thing is using this mixed effects framework that we talked a little bit about last week and you saw a mention of this in both papers today. So here, an alternative formulation of the same model is, so again, it's errors as a function of speed, but I'm saying, these observations are clustered by typist ID. Um, and I'm giving it a random intercept for each of these cluster IDs. Okay, so I'm saying the observations are clustered by ID and each typist has 
their own uh, mean typing speed, say, that's different. Okay. So the difference between this, oh, and looking at the estimated model, you see here um, essentially this qualitatively the same result. Okay. So there is a positive relationship between speed and errors. This is 1.4-ish, okay, 1.4-ish more errors for every unit increase in speed. If we look at the one above, you have 1.4-ish more errors for every unit increase in speed. Okay, so that, that makes sense. That all makes sense. Um, you're seeing the same thing, except you're not seeing explicit coefficient estimates for all of the different factors there, all of the different levels in that uh, typist factor. Okay, so I've, I've treated the typist as this random effect here, uh, and I'm not choosing to estimate a coefficient for each individual typist relative to some baseline. I, I, don't, I don't care, uh, I, I don't care about any individual typist in that way but I, I just care to model that individual typists may have different average typing speeds. I, I wanna account for that. And I wanna account for the fact that these speed measurements are clustered by typists. They're not independent, right? So I'm doing that here, but I don't care to estimate explicitly a coefficient for any individual typist. That's sort of the idea behind these, these random effects versus fixed effects. So now, um, if you go to the Google Drive folder, um, not now, but, but after class, you will find um, I posted a, a whole bunch of readings about mixed effects regression. Um, there's a lot of useful information in there about when you might prefer to use this random effects framework over the fixed effects framework above. Okay, so that's a very lengthy discussion, but it's sort of very informative. I've picked some cool readings. So, you know, ch check that out and ask me questions afterwards. Um, okay, so that's all fine, you're saying, maybe, but we still haven't captured both of those patterns, right? So, so far, I haven't given you anything new. I'm still only capturing this um, individual level pattern. I have still yet to capture the group level pattern. Correct? Okay, so how do I do that? So this is where I think Jeremy's suggestion comes in. So what if I split my variable of interest, typing speed, I split that into two variables um, to capture the two different sources of variance. One variable is each typist's average typing speed. Okay. And the other, the other variable is the deviation of each measurement from that typist's overall mean. So going back to this thing, okay, I split these speed uh, measurements for every typist into two variables. One is their mean and two is the deviation from their mean. Okay, so basically this is called mean centering, right? I'm, I'm subtracting the mean essentially of every individual from their measurements. Does that make sense? So it's the, the sum of those two is still literally the same measurement of speed for that person, but I've just, chosen to represent it as this sum of two things, their actual mean plus or minus whatever uh, difference there is, right? Between the actual measurement and their mean. That makes sense? So let's say uh, every person in this sample contributes, I don't know, 30, 30 up data points. I don't know how many there are, but let's say 30, okay? And they're all different for speed and for errors, presumably. So now 
those 30 measurements of speed for this first person become the sum of that person's mean speed, which is obviously going to be the same for all 30 because it's computed across all those 30, okay? Uh, and whatever's left to get to the original values, okay? So that's the trick. That's, I think, what Jeremy was suggesting. Um, so now here's what happens, right? So here's the way of doing this. I, um, I'm calling this speed mean. I'm calling it the mean of speed. And the error is whatever's left, whatever's the difference between the actual measurement and the average. And, and this is grouped by ID. So you see some sort of R syntax to achieve this here. Uh, you can find many other ways of doing the same thing, but that's sort of what I'm doing here. I'm doing what I just described. So you see that, right. So here's an example, right? For typing, uh, a typist ID one, you see their mean speed is whatever this value is and whatever's left over is the error. Right, so now the model becomes um, becomes this thing here, okay? So instead of the actual speed, I've replaced that one variable by these two things, right? The mean and the whatever's left, okay? And everything else is the same. So I'm still clustering by ID, uh, and I'm still modeling errors as a function of speed. Okay, so now check this out, because uh, now we're golden. So look what happens. When I do this, when I do this, look how I'm able to capture both of those patterns that we wanted to capture. So it's still the case that across people, looking at the mean, uh, the coefficient for mean here, across people, the faster people on average make fewer typing errors, negative coefficient. And individually, as you type faster, you tend to make more errors. So notice how this decomposition, this de-meaning, de-meaning, um, subtracting the mean, this decomposition here um, allowed me to capture both of these patterns okay, really well. Now, as it stands, um, the coefficient for the group level pattern is not statistically significant. That could very well be the case because I only have five observations. I don't, just don't have enough data. Okay, so you know, don't read too much into that for this particular example. Um, but the, the general idea holds here. Okay, so this is very, very cool. Um, it's a very powerful um, formulation of something like this because it allows you to correctly, jointly model both the group level patterns and the individual level patterns in the same model as well as account for the fact that these are non-independent observations. So I have this clustering by uh, typist. Okay, so this is very, very cool. Okay, I could, do, I could do all of this. I could model both of those patterns jointly, as well as resolve this non-independence issue that was a problem to begin with. Okay, so this... What you see here in the simple example is a very powerful way of, um, of modeling something like this, meaning data that is um, clustered or hierarchical or nested in some form, which is more or less all data you could think of in the social sciences, okay? Uh, and not fall prey to, or, or victims, uh, not fall victim to something like Simpson's paradox. Okay, because I'm able to detect both of those things jointly and, and model them separately, explicitly. Okay, so it's very, very cool. So the readings you find in that folder uh, actually talk a lot about this in, in a lot more detail. And there's also a few more examples. Um, but you know, if, if you remember one thing from today's lecture, right? Remember that there's this very cool formulation of um, um, regression problem that allows you to do all of these things jointly and elegantly. Okay, so no Simpsons paradox problem, 
and dealing with the non-independence issue. Okay, all in one. Okay, so let's, let's stop here. We'll pick this up. Um, I guess we didn't have time to do the interrupted time series. We'll do that on Thursday. We'll have a, a lecture about that on Thursday.